Welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host and author, Dr. Holly Thacker, and thanks for joining us for Chapter 5, Menopause and Appearance. Most of the time, women don't separate how they look from how they feel. Physical appearance and emotional well-being are closely related. When you dress as if you're ready for a ball, you feel like a queen. When you can slide into those skinny jeans, nothing can stop you. And when you're having a good hair day, well, regardless of how superficial that sounds, you just feel better. Menopause can be associated with a number of changes in the physical appearance. Skin can lose elasticity, hair can get thinner, and unfortunately, many curse that menopot belly. Once menopause hits, a woman's first concerns are usually with the more disruptive symptoms, such as sleep loss, dry vagina, hot flashes, and mood swings. When she gains control over the more serious matters, she may then focus on those related to looks, like skin, hair, and other body concerns. Changes in physical appearance are sometimes the most frustrating aspect of menopause, and it's no secret why. Society conditions women to focus on the exterior, and women's magazines all claim to offer numerous means to restoring your lost youth. There is a reason we see so many products on the market designed to make us look and feel our best. Our culture does promote an image of beauty that's sometimes completely unrealistic. Veronica, wow, I'm so happy now I don't have periods or cramps anymore. I notice, though, that my skin is dull and dry, and most concerning is I've started to lose clumps of hair. I expected that my skin would change somewhat, but my appearance has just changed so quickly. Can you tell which of Veronica's symptoms stem from lack of estrogen or which symptoms might be a sign of something beyond menopause? When I saw Veronica in the office, in addition to a history and physical hormonal assessment, I wanted to be sure that her iron levels were normal. Research has shown that low iron levels can accelerate hair loss and cause fatigue. When assessing for hair loss, anything more than 150 hairs in the hairbrush per day is too much, but 100 per day is normal. I found that Veronica was quite low in iron. This cause of low iron was a bleeding cancerous colon polyp that was found after going evaluation and full colonoscopy and upper endoscopy because we found her iron stores were depleted and too low. After this bleeding polyp was removed, her iron stores removed when she took a prescription iron supplement with some vitamin C, and her hair became thicker, and with the use of local skincare products, as well as a healthy diet and exercise regimen, her skin became brighter. Now, I also check for vitamin D levels and zinc and sometimes vitamin E, as well as a dietary assessment of protein and check the hormones. My very first Speaking of Women's Health podcast, which you can subscribe to our podcast, was actually on iron. And um, it's very important for women over 40 not to just ascribe low iron to periods, pregnancy, and lactation, but to evaluate for other sources of loss. Now, this is what Veronica said to me. When I get dressed in the morning and style my hair, I no longer have huge chunks of hair coming out. And my energy's back. I'm not chewing on ice cubes anymore, which Dr. Thacker told me was pica, a sign of low iron. I am so glad that I underwent that colonoscopy, even though I thought my low iron state was just from having years of menstrual periods. And now that I've replaced my iron and I am on a multiple vitamin, and I'm on some gelatin for skin and hair, I possess a good skin regimen, I feel so much better. So you may ask, could hormones help improve my appearance? When my patients discuss menopausal symptoms, skin and hair are often key concerns. Many women want to know if hormones could make them look better. A typical conversation with my patients may go like this. Dr. Thacker, I really care about my my bones and my heart disease, but I really... It's not my priority because I just want my hair and skin to look good. And that's why I want to take hormones. And I say, well, okay. I usually reply, it's fine um, to care about how you look, but let's still check your cholesterol and your bone density while you're here. So 
what you see in the mirror does affect how you feel emotionally. And if you feel better on hormones because they improve your skin or make you feel more vibrant, I will prescribe them as long as you understand the risk and benefits and I can monitor how you're doing. My belief is that the reasons a woman wants hormone therapy are personal. They're her decisions. In case you couldn't tell by now, in my mind, women's health is about personal choice. When our culture tells us daily that appearance is important, how can we tune these messages out completely? Besides, we know from experience that we do feel better when we look better. And we can control the choices we make that affect how we look and feel. And real life solutions can range from medical skin care and in future upcoming podcasts on our regular channel, we will have skincare estheticians and skin experts to diet, to lifestyle, and for some, when indicated, hormone therapy. So we'll talk about each of them. Skin care. Skin care, <clears throat> the skin rather, which is your largest organ, can take a lot more abuse when it's younger. By the time you hit menopause, though, it doesn't heal as fast as it used to. For instance, look at what happens with cuts. Your child's cut can heal in just hours, but you might be wearing a Band-Aid for the next day or the day after. Similarly, skincare regimens that are appropriate for your teenage daughter will not suit you. During the menopausal years, women may experience the following symptoms. Dryness. Women produce less oil as they age. Lack of oil in the skin causes it to send thirst signals in the form of of either itching or dry patches. In severe cases, women can have chronic itching. I recommend very practical solutions such as using an emollient like Lubriderm or substituting a standard bar soap which can irritate sensitive skin with like an Aveeno oatmeal moisturizing bar. If your skin is excessively dry, you perhaps are bathing too much. Arms and legs do not need to be scrubbed daily unless they have actual physical dirt on them. Concentrate on cleaning areas like the face, feet, groin, and underarms, which do need to be washed daily. After bathing, apply a moisturizer while your body is still damp. This traps water and protects the skin from losing hydration. A little sidebar on feeding your skin. There is truth in the adage, you are what you eat. If you starve your skin of important nutrients, it will show. So stock your pantry with these skin power foods yellow and orange foods. Vitamin A, which is found in foods like carrots, pumpkins, benefits the skin cells. Berries, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, plums are high in antioxidants, which are substances that inhibit reactions promoted by oxygen. The phytochemicals in these fruits can protect your skin from cell damaging free radicals. Fatty acids, salmon, walnuts, canola oil, flaxseed, contain omega-3 and omega-6, which support the health of your skin cell membranes. The cell membranes help the skin retain moisture. Healthy oils. Oils keep the skin lubricated. Look for those labeled as cold-pressed, expeller-pressed, or extra virgin. These processes ensure that oils do not lose nutrients during processing. Whole grains, cereal, turkey, tuna, these foods contain selenium, which protects skin cells. Green teas. The anti-inflammatory properties of green tea protect cell membranes and are beneficial to overall skin health. Water. Water hydrates the skin and helps cells remove the toxins and soak in the nutrients. When we are well hydrated, we sweat efficiently, cleaning and clearing the skin. Tender skin. That's another sign. Maybe you've never had sensitive skin, but during menopause, you wonder whether the bathing products or laundry detergents are the source of your discomfort. It is possible because the skin gets thinner and becomes more delicate as we age. So perfumes or cosmetics that didn't bother you before may irritate you now. The nipples and genital skin are especially prone to adverse reactions, soaps, lotions, and other cleaning products. If your skin is sensitive, especially if you have eczema, or burning of the nipples or vulva, please wear only white cotton undergarments. And when you wash your clothes, rinse the bra and underwear twice and don't use those dryer sheets. Their anti-static agents can cause irritation and itching. Adult breakouts. We'll be back after a quick break. 
Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or go search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. At midlife, it often seems like women who just breezed through puberty without a single breakout are reaching for cover-up foundation, while those of us who suffer through acne in our younger years are sometimes free and clear from acne. One of the skincare estheticians, <clears throat> who is a medical and beauty, beauty skincare esthetician, notices that this paradox frequently occurs in her clients and she sees more midlife women dealing with stress hormone acne than she did in the past. So stress hormone acne occurs when stress-related hormones cause excess oil production that clogs your pores which become infected and cause acne. And she attributes some of this to the additional stress on today's women from the environment and their daily lives. So what is your ideal skincare regimen? What can you do about it? Many women are confused about what they need, which is why I recommend you consider seeing a skincare esthetician. You can adopt a skincare regimen like the one below, which focuses on four steps. Prepare, correct, protect, and stimulate. For the care of midlife skin, think gentle, preventive, and protective. Avoid harsh soaps. Moisturize and exfoliate on a regular basis, but not an excessive basis, to get rid of dead skin. And please, please protect your skin from the sun and elements. And you don't have to purchase a shelf full of products to accomplish these four steps of proper skin care. All you need is a cleanser, which should contain less perfume and fewer additives than a product bought at a makeup counter. You need a good sunscreen, one that blocks UVA and B. You might need a color corrector and an antioxidant serum to polish and brighten the skin while deeply exfoliating. So prepare and clean the skin with a product free of fragrances and additives. Some medical lines like Biomedic or Obagi are ones that I tend to like because they contain concentrations of active ingredients that generally you cannot purchase in the same strength over the counter. Look for an acidic cleanser with a pH lower than 5.5. Generally, liquids are better than bars. Protect. Sunblock is an important part of good skin care at any time of life. So if you live on planet Earth, you're exposed to ultraviolet uh, rays from the sun. UVA are present all day long, year-round. And they can penetrate glass and go straight through to the underlayer of the surface. So UVA rays are responsible for long-term skin damage that comes with aging. UVB rays cannot pass through glass, but they can tan or burn skin. UVB rays are more intense in the summer. So check the ingredients in your sunblock. You want a product that protects against UVA and B. Anthelios is a product that um, has the ultra-potent sunscreen Meroxyl that blocks both UVA and UVB and may have a moisturizing cream in it. Neutrogena also carries products with Meroxyl. So women who've had skin cancer or trouble his, trouble with melasma, which is a hormonally stimulated skin, skin pigmentation known as the, quote, mask of pregnancy, or simply women who want the best wrinkle protection, should choose a product that has UVA and UVB protection. I personally like the Anthelios SPF of 60 because not only does it have this broad spectrum sunscreen, but it has like a mild illuminizer sun brightener. And there's many other uh, options that you can choose from. Correction. You may actually choose to correct your blemishes with a color corrector, such as a concealer or a foundation. Stimulate. If you apply lots of moisturizer, but you still feel dry, 
chances are you need to exfoliate. Your moisturizer probably cannot penetrate the skin because of excess dead cells. Exfoliating or sloughing off the dead skin cells helps your skin renew itself more quickly than it does naturally. And you can improve your skin's appearance and reduce pimples and blackheads, as well as allowing your moisturizer to penetrate and do its job. Now, if you see a skincare esthetician, uh, which I like to periodically do at least once a season, they can actually dermablade with a scalpel and scrape off that dead skin because the older one gets, the harder it is for the skin to naturally shed. Check ingredients of exfoliation at the drugstore. You're looking for products that contain like alpha hydroxy or beta hydroxy acids, which remove skin through fine exfoliation and they shouldn't cause redness or flaking. You don't need to go to the cosmetic counter and spend a fortune for an exclusive serum because there are lots of affordable options on the market. The best solution for exfoliation, however, is to use a medical grade line. These contain more concentrated amounts of alpha hydroxy, beta hydroxy, and over-the-counter than over-the-counter substances can provide. Now, there are prescription products like Retin-A or Tazerac um, that exfoliate deeply, and many times they'll be peeling, which is a sign of increased blood flow, which isn't always a bad thing. Some women will add moisturizers to these regimens to prevent the skin from peeling. A milder form of retinoic acid like Differin Gel, 0.3% may control acne, help with exfoli exfoliation, and reduce fine wrinkling. And there is Differin 0.1, which is not quite as potent and can be obtained without a prescription. Copper creams and active vitamin C applied topically can help stimulate collagen formation. Aminopeptides and substances known as kinerases are also used in some skin rejuvenation products. Many women discover that their skin can glow and feel wonderful when they care for it through a combination of diet, exercise, and adequate hydration, complete smoke avoidance, beauty sleep, along with an excellent skin care regimen that includes skin sun protection as well as some topical rejuvenation creams. And sometimes toners uh, are used. So getting a consultation with a skincare esthetician, I think can be very helpful because everybody's skin is unique. And certainly the stages in life you're in reflect as well, what are the best skincare products to use? Let's move on to hair. Some women notice hair loss during menopause. Thinning hair is related to aging. By age 40, many women also show signs of so called androgenic alopecia, a common so called male pattern thinning, but can happen in women because we women have testosterone as well. As mentioned earlier, if you're losing more than 150 strands per day, then you're shedding too much hair. Hair loss in midlife can be more severe and obvious for some women, and there's a few reasons why. Number one, hormonal fluctuations. And these hormonal fluctuations during menopause can trigger hair thinning. If women lose too much estrogen, the hair can thin. Conversely, if a woman has too much testosterone in her system, or if dipping estrogen levels result in an increase in the relative amounts of testosterone and or increased sensitivity to the effects of testosterone at the hair follicle level, then the amount of hair loss will exceed hair growth. Not a good thing. And just with aging alone, I tell women that 40% of women lose about 40% of hair. It's just a fact. Just like your eyes aren't the same, your heart rate can't get up as fast, your skin doesn't heal as fast, the hair is naturally thinner with age. Genetics. Androgenic alopecia is very common for genetically transmitted hair thinning in both men and women. In androgenic alopecia, the active derivation of testosterone called dihydrotestosterone binds very tightly to receptors in the scalp follicles, particularly on the temporal areas and the top of the head. Even though we obviously don't need any hair to live, it's symbolic and it's an important part of many women's appearances. And it can be very distressing if their physicians just shrug off their hair loss. During menopause and estrogen, as estrogen levels decline, 
the level of testosterone can be a powerful factor. So you still have the same amount of testosterone, but the DHT, the active testosterone, is more able to act on the hair follicles without estrogen. So pre-existing androgenic alopecia gets worse at the time of menopause or any hormonal perturbation. So women with AGA don't become bald like men do. But that being said, the condition is challenging and you really want to stop it in its tracks early rather than wait till you've lost the hair and have scarring at the hair follicle level. Medical side effects. Another reason for hair thinning can be use of certain medications. These medicines include things that are used to treat high blood pressure, heart problems, depression, gout, chemotherapy, radiation given to cancer patients. And in some cases, unusually high levels of vitamin A or low levels of vitamin D, low levels of zinc, low levels of vitamin E, and not adequate protein ingestion all can take its toll on your hair. Illness. Finally, hair loss can be caused by unrelated illnesses, including thyroid disorders, which affect a lot of women, severe infection, flu, COVID. Most people after recovering from COVID have hair thinning that takes several months to recover. Fungal infections, including ringworm of the scalp, all of which have nothing to do with menopause. So what can I do if I'm experiencing hair loss? First of all, find a physician who's interested in your overall health. Could be a dermatologist or a hormone specialist. Could be your primary care doctor. You do need a thorough thorough evaluation of skin and hair, nutrition, hormones, and your medical circumstances. Bring in all your medications and supplements. Most women can benefit from some gelatin. A lot of women will take biotin forte or other prescription vitamins for hair. Just beware that high doses of biotin, which are probably better for the nails than the hair, do interfere with lots of blood work. Shampoos such as Nizoral can block the DHT production at the hair follicle level. And high-potency Rogaine, also known as Minoxidil, is now over-the-counter without a prescription. And the high-potency 5% foam certainly can improve hair thinning. I personally uh, put a little bit of that foam on a Q-tip and put it on the lateral aspects of my eyebrows. Because with age, a lot of women will lose some of their eyebrows. And of course, we check for thyroid, but a lot of times it's just from aging or excessive plucking. Now, if you're going to use Rogaine high-potency foam, You must use it faithfully for six months before you know how much hair growth it will restore. And some women do complain. They think it's a little messy and inconvenient. I found on the eyebrow level that it worked very quickly. And if you stray up or down, you get hair growth. Um, So I think it's worthwhile trying. Some dermatologists will prescribe low-dose oral minoxidil, which is used as a blood pressure um, medication. I do tend to favor oral hormone therapy as opposed to transdermal hormone therapy for menopausal women concerned about skin and hair changes because by taking it by mouth, it goes through the stomach and liver and it, and it increases sex binding globulin hormone, which binds to some of that active free testosterone. Now, women can't have a history of blood clots or high triglycerides, uh, but if you've had pregnancies and taken birth control pills and you don't have any of those medical concerns, you might want to favor oral hormone therapy over transdermal if you're mainly focused on skin and hair. Now, spironolactone is a potassium-sparing diuretic, and it blocks the effects of dihydrotestosterone on the hair follicle, and it produces improvements in both acne and hair thinning. However, if you use it alone in pre- and perimenopausal women, it can be associated with menstrual disorders. So I usually use hormonal contraception or hormonal therapy in conjunction with spironolactone. Several years ago, a novel form of spironolactone, it's listed as a progestin, but it's really not derived from progesterone. It's called drosperinone, was developed. And it hit the market in the form of Yaz and Yasmin. And it became worldwide one of the top birth control pills because it doesn't cause weight gain or bloating. And because it's an analog to spironolactone, it's got really great effects on skin and hair. And in 2006, Yaz, the lower dose of Yasmin, became available for hormonal contraception, acne treatment, 
and it's the first hormonal pill that was FDA approved for the treatment of PMS. Some newer versions of Yaz include Biaz, which has L-methylfolate, which is good for the brain. It's the active uh, metabolite of folic acid. And Safrol, which is a higher dose of uh, Biaz that has the same vitamin. So you can also use, assuming you have normal kidney function and you don't have elevated potassium, you can use these hormonal agents with spironolactone. Um, the hormone, menopausal hormone therapy. We'll be back after a quick break. Have you ever experienced fitness failure? You know, you set a, a goal to exercise, you're all excited, and then you're not. Hi, I'm Dave. I host the daily 10-minute podcast, Walking is Fitness. Instead of an exercise goal, I talk about making a fitness promise. And every day you keep that promise, you add another link to a growing fitness chain. This is a podcast of action. You'll create a fitness habit, which eventually becomes fitness momentum, and then on to all kinds of good stuff. Check it out. Walking is fitness, and let's take a daily 10-minute walk together. Option that is available is bioidentical estradiol with drosperinone in a pill called Angelique. And um, this comes in higher doses drosperinone in Europe, which also treats hypertension. So if you've exhausted all the medical, nutritional, hormonal, and dermatologic treatments for hair loss, in severe cases, you may want to explore more intensive treatment like PRP, which many cosmetic dermatologists do. Uh, where they take your blood, spin it down for the platelet-rich factor, and then inject that under the skin. Lasers have been first approved for male pattern hair thinning and now are also approved for female pattern hair thinning because, again, it's the same process, just in a different sex. Uh, if you're going to spend several hundred dollars getting a laser cap, laser comb, laser headband, I would try to get one with a money-back guarantee and take pictures of your scalp before and after and expect this is going to take some time. There are hair replacement procedures such as grafting, but in my experience, you know, women don't usually need to choose this. Um, there are hair extensions. There's great wigs that a lot of women just like to wear for style. There's also a um, spray called Topic, T-O-P-P-I-K, that you can get over the counter that I found out from one of my patients who came in to see me and I'm like, oh my goodness, Anna, what happened to your hair? She's like, oh, same hair I've always had. I just rushed in here to see you and I forgot to spray my topic. And you get it the same color as your hair color and spray it so it covers up the scalp. So um, there's also creative ways to style the hair and hairspray uh, and things like that that can be done. And your hairstylist, who's like a best friend, can also be very helpful. So weight, oh, that affects your appearance. It's a fact of life. Your metabolism slows down as you get older. With each decade, there's a significant loss in metabolism. Declining hormones can eat away at your muscle mass, and muscle burns more calories than fat. So most women sadly gain 10 to 15 pounds at midlife, and 10 to 30 pounds of weight loss is not unusual, and that does increase cancer risk, heart disease risk, diabetes risk, trouble with your joints. So this is far more than a cosmetic issue. The harsh reality is with age, burning calories and keeping the extra weight off takes more work, but you're worth it. So if a simple pill could reverse our metabolic slowdown or make our bodies burn calories while we lay on the couch, uh, most Americans would pay handsomely for this. The bad news is there's really no such thing. There are some ejectable peptides, um, that in patients with diabetes or severe weight problems hold a lot of promise and we'll probably do future podcasts on this. But for most midlife women, what you need to do is get eight hours of sleep, do intermittent fasting, do exercise that focuses on weightlifting to maintain muscle mass and restrict calories. It's a fact. You need to do all of those things. And for women who do all those things and don't lose weight and are frustrated, I tell them at least you haven't gained weight. So don't be too hard on yourself. We're going to talk about nutrition, vitamins, and healthy 
eating in the next chapter, chapter six. But for now, let's focus on getting physical and why no woman can ignore the importance of regular exercise. Work out a plan. And exercise doesn't have to mean marathon training or bulking up at the gym. Yes, your goal is to build lean muscle mass. And the way you do this is lifting weights. And you need to burn calories, which is accomplished by aerobic activities. But you want to set realistic fitness goals. You need to stretch before and after. You have to be more concerned about overuse with age. And you want to enjoy what you're doing. And you want to be able to stick with this program. And if you can't stand the thought of running laps on a track, you're not going to last more than a week. In fact, I am not a jogger. I think I gave it up at age 16. (laughs) Read Get Inspired. There are shelves of books on the subject of exercise. Some love yoga. We've got some great information on the health benefits of yoga on our speakingofwomenshealth.com site. The point is inspire yourself. There's a lot of great books. Dr. Pamela Peake has written uh, Body for Life, A Woman's Plan for Physical and Mental Transformation. Dr. Lou Aroni wrote um, Getting Healthy, A Plan for Permanent Weight Loss. Way Less, Live Longer. Um, There's lots of really good books. And we have a lot of good information about exercise and physical fitness and getting physical on our speakingofwomenshealth.com site. Every woman's fitness goals are different. And certainly you can go to your local library um, if you're able to get a fitness instructor uh, who's expert with midlife women, especially if you have any orthopedic concerns. You might want to start with an actual physical therapist that your physician refers you to. Don't just read about exercise. Um, Don't put off doing the footwork. Remember, you need to do it every day. Group work. For many women, having an exercise buddy or hearing encouragement from a friend is what gets you to a workout. So if this describes you, consider signing up for exercise classes with a friend, learn a new dance routine, try Pilates, uh, which is a great form of stretching and strengthening. Venture into kickboxing or Tai Chi or water aerobics if you've got access to a pool. Variety in workout also tones different muscle and muscle groups and prevents boredom. And if you sign up with a friend or a family member, you might be less likely to skip class. Look for a woman-friendly gym. Some women feel more comfortable in a same-sex environment. Places like Curves cater to women. Take the long route. If you want to incorporate exercise into your lifestyle, think of little things you can do every day. Take the stairs. Park your car a little farther away from buildings. Power walk for 10 minutes before, before work, during lunch, or in the evening. Then you get 30 minutes total. Even short spurts of exercise help. Track your steps. Consider buying a pedometer or putting it on your your cell phone. If you can reach 10,000 steps a day, that's terrific. But just start with a goal at least five or 6,000 steps a day and work up. You might be surprised to find, as I did, that on days that you feel very tired, you've walked the least. So when I started tracking my own steps, I discovered that if I was seeing patients in my office all day, I might feel exhausted by the time I drove home. Mentally, I had run miles, but my physical activity was still way below my goals. On the other hand, when I'm literally running errands, exercising during my son's sports practices or grocery shopping or running around now taking care of my granddaughter, I can easily rack up 10,000 steps because I'm not sitting in front of a computer. So it does pay to track and increase your activities as necessary. And on days you think you'll fall short, like maybe you have a long car trip, get up early and get to the gym. Try walking nine holes of golf instead of being in the cart or make a tennis date. Um, One thing though, when I'm tracking my steps, I'm definitely more motivated to take the stairs and walk the extra distance because I know I have a target. Sometimes it works against me a little bit in that instead of riding the stationary bicycle, which has some... um, good benefits, less stress on the knees, uh, or swimming, you know, where you're not tracking your steps. So you don't want to get too addicted to the pedometer. Um, some women like to journal what their exercise and their food intake. Um, you know, one size does not fit all. It is important to learn to relax because many physical disorders are stress related, headaches, back pain, musculoskeletal pain. And when you're stressed, your body makes too much cortisol. 
And there's definitely a link between cortisol and abdominal fat, which is the worst fat to have because it increases heart disease and diabetes. What's more, stress is a sneaky stumbling block in our plans to exercise and eat well. Relaxation is not a natural activity for many people because a lot of women are programmed to go, go, go. So please take the time to wind down, breathe deeply, block out distracting thoughts, and make time to meditate and have quiet time just to yourself. Just think of all the ordinary stresses that you encounter every day. Add in the stress of menopause, midlife, family concerns, work concerns. You'll realize why relaxation is such an important part of a healthful daily routine. Try some relaxation techniques. See the ones that you like. Don't get stressed about not having enough time to relax, though. Rhythmic breathing can be helpful. Deep breathing, visualized breathing, progressive muscle relaxation. Some people relax to music or do mental imagery. Many women turn to yoga or meditation. Certainly what you do need is some positive self-talk every day. Repeat some positive statements like, be strong, be healthy, be in charge, which is our motto. So it's your choice. In many respects, your health and how you feel about yourself is your choice. Certainly the decisions you make concerning appearance, weight, fitness, the ability to relax uh, are in your control. Some women just don't seem to get the connection. And I see some women who eat organic foods but smoke or work out nuts but reward themselves with junk food. Menopausal women terrified by exaggerated risk of hormone therapy but they gobble tons of unregulated herbs, supplements, and other concoctions that haven't been rigorously tested or monitored. Some women are are afraid to undergo pre-proven screening tests. Others don't find the time to buckle up their seatbelts, which certainly does save lives. So it is important to look at the overall situation and, and don't fall prey to misguided thinking. Please follow this advice of this podcast. Stick with proven techniques to help yourself look and feel your best. And don't ignore the warning symptoms. And don't get into less than safe health practices that some women adopt. If something sounds too good to be true and is being pushed at a financial cost, beware. Now, changes to skin and weight and other physical attributes may occur gradually or they might just come out of nowhere. Caring for yourself, dealing with these changes in a positive fashion gives you the opportunity to make health and wellness and happiness a priority. So take care of your skin and hair. Use what remedies work well for you. But please don't let our culture's perverse obsession with an overly youthful appearance force you to feel bad about the fact that you're maturing. Choose an approach to exercise that fits with your lifestyle. Please, though, be sure to add weight-bearing, muscle-building activities. Don't forget to relax deeply and often. It's good for you and for those around you. And please, talk to your doctor about hormone therapy and find out whether you need it. It can make a big difference. You have a whole life to live. You might as well feel good and look good while living your best self. So you've been joining... The Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I am your host and author, Dr. Holly Thacker. And please join me next time for Chapter 6, Healthy Nutrition for a Healthy Midlife.